Pues, eh, bienvenidos. Eh. Welcome again to this uh, seminar, the seminar itself. The academic content of the European Charles V Award, Antonio Tajani, about European Union and the principle of solidarity. We have split this seminar in nine panels, and each one will be presenting its topic. The first one will be chaired by Professor Enrique Moradiellos Garcia, a contemporary history professor at the History Department of the University of Extremadura since 2006. He had previously taught the same subject at the University of London, Queen Mary at Westfield College, and the Complutense University of Madrid, the Faculty of Geography and History. His main lines of research focus on the Spanish and European history of the 20th century, particularly in the interwar period, 1919-1939, World War II, and the Cold War. Among his main works are El Reñedero de Europa, Las Dimensiones Internacionales de la Guerra Civil Española, Peninsula Publishing House, Don Juan Negrín, and he also did his PhD thesis about it, La Semilla de la Barbarie, Antisemitismo y Holocausto, 2009. He was awarded the National History Prize in 2017 for his book, Historia Minima de la Guerra Civil Española. And he's also a member of the Royal Academy of History since 2020, and he will be doing his speech before the Royal Academy of History this Sunday. So thank you, Enrique, once again for taking part in this seminar of the Yusuf Foundation. You have the floor. Thank you, Miguel Angel. Please allow me to take the mask off. Thank you for these kind words. They show the generosity of Miguel more than the merits of uh, myself. I want to thank again the Foundation for the privilege of uh, having been invited to this doctoral seminar. We were missing it after this year and a half that has been so harsh on us. So thank you. That will be the starting point of my speech, with, because as uh, the director, Juan Carlos Moreno, was saying, this meeting, this gathering, for those of us who have um, gone a long way to say a euphemism, these gatherings are vital, because this is the agora of Athens. And this is the way you have to see it. This is the place where we are creating a dialogue with each other looking at the logos of each other, because those who, those who are smart are those who listen to each other. So thank you for this opportunity. And thank you again for letting me chair this panel that has um, two participants. I'm going to um, check about the first one. They will be talking about a critical topic. What do we mean by principle of solidarity and not something else. Principle is already an interesting word, but what does principle of solidarity mean? The first um, uh, lecture is uh, by Ruben Simank. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. It's about the principle of European solidarity in times of crisis, and he clarifies it in its text. On the principle of European solidarity in times of crisis. Es una tarea fascinante. It is quite a fascinating, a fascinating task. Also somehow intimidating, but I hope and I know that you will be accomplishing it successfully because of your background. It's an um, enviable background. He has a degree in um, com um, compared literature yeah, University of Berlin and a master's degree from the London School of Economics and History and Cultural Theory, Humboldt University, Berlin, 
and he's doing a PhD at the European University Institute in Florence. So he is the perfect Erasmus of Rotterdam of the 21st century. And such a person with such an um, outstanding background has a reason to speak about what he will be speaking about, which does not prevent us from criticizing it, nor constructively or destructively, but a truly um, a true criticism, an earnest criticism, um, which will give you a different perspective. We will have also the occasion to conduct a debate to criticize it. But first, we have to listen to this speech by Ruben Simank. So you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Enrico, for the kind introduction. Um, and also, let me start by thanking uh, the Eustace Foundation for making this event possible, also because I'm the first speaker, so I have to really say thanks for everything. Um, and thank you in particular, Miguel, for the, you know, the organization over this sort of long period by now, because the seminar was obviously shifted due to COVID. So thanks a lot for the really kind contact. And um, also thank you, Mr. Juan Carlos Pinero, for the inspiring speech. And yeah, like some others as well, like I came all the way from Berkeley in California, so I'm slightly jet lagged. Um, but it, like, I really look forward to our discussion in the next days. Um, so I'm going to talk, as uh, Enrique already mentioned, um, about the principle of solidarity and in the European Union. And I will start with a brief introduction um, and talk about what I think are important genealogies of the term, so in a really historical sense. Um, quite often in the, let's say, larger discourse that really emerged around the notion of European solidarity recently in mainly in political science, but also in sociology and social science more generally. It's often referred to um, the origins in Roman law, but it's really rarely actually discussed what it means and what was actually um, the sort of semantic notion behind it. So I'm going to briefly talk about that and then show what I think is the important shift, um, where that really shifts from Roman law to a legal and political concept um, in the French Third Republic, but also over the 19th century, if you want. But I'm going to really focus on two specific cases that I think are important, also given the sort of scope of the paper. So there's, of course, many traditions you can refer to if you talk about the history of solidarity. Um, but I'm going to try to sort of distill a very European notion about it. Um, and then I will turn to the present and sort of apply the idea that once you say that there is something like a regulation or construction via law, then you might turn to the present and look at how it is, you know, sort of performed or regulated via law in the EU today. So again, I'm not going to look and actually look at an interpretation of the case law or something, but rather try to distill the underlying um, philosophical underpinning, if you want, what the notion means. Um, and I will end by looking at the um, sort of, I would say that like there's a shift between um, the notion of solidarity between people, so you, I think, can trace that, and then to states. And I will end with um, a sort of outlook that argues that there might be a conflicting notion between these terms. So uh, generally, I would say that there's something like a general argument whether or not solidarity is kind of the reason or the solution for a contemporary crisis in the EU. So often it's used as a legal principle, sometimes as a political narrative, and not to mention too many sort of instances where it's used, it's basically used all the time. Um, you could find so many quotes on where especially politicians and European politicians in particular use the term as a um, rhetorical device. Um, that was, we'll hear this again in the next days, I think. The migration crisis was, the so-called migration crisis was the case, the debt crisis. Um, the COVID crisis, of course, uh, triggered that again. Um, and, for example, the Commission also uses it, so the hashtag European Solidarity um, during the COVID times was one of them. But what's interesting, it's kind of across levels, so it's also happening in civil society and cultural practitioners um, and also in national contexts. So then we might ask what is actually sort of distinctly European about it. The term solidarity is obviously much older, as we will also see in a second, um, but what is actually the sort of European uh, version of it is there, is, if there is one, and how did it then um, sort of develop as a legal principle, and actually how can we better understand the conceptual understanding that, it's used, that is used in the 
um, sort of European framework context. So just to say why this is a bit of a different approach, so if you would uh, look at public opinion research, for example, then you will rather trace the opinions around the notion, right? You will not actually look at the philosophical content of a legal concept. So that's the idea, you kind of rather do the latter and not actually um, simply trace opinions, which is in itself also important, but it's been done a lot recently, so this is a kind of different approach. So again, often it's, it's portrayed as the, the reason and the solution, and then um, if it's portrayed as the solution, it's often done in a legal stability sense, so it's something that might actually produce um, cohesion um, and you know, might lead to a legal stability between member states. Uh, the question then is, how do you analyze it? And again, I'm not going to do a quantitative analysis, but rather look back into the um, history of it and draw on political theory. Um, so I already talked with Enrique about this a second ago, but if you, like the sort of standard narrative I would say is that you can, or maybe not the standard narrative, but one of the narratives you might use in political philosophy is that you look at the French Revolution's motto, which obviously became sort of a leading ideal in the modern body politic, um, also across different ideologies. Uh, then, of course, um, for those of you who are trained in philosophy know this, there are thousands of books written on liberty and distinctions made from, you know, for example, Isaiah Berlin between positive and negative liberty and so on. The, sta the same holds for equality. But in comparison, um, even though this is slowly changing now, but there is definitely less written, or it's still fair to say that there's less written on the third one, um, which is solidarity. So it's kind of worth to take that perspective and look at the broader kind of um, history of it. So back to that first quick question, I just want to mention this because also there are so many historians in the room. I think it's quite interesting. If you look at a, uh, maybe you know the Engram viewer, like you can, it's a very easy analysis. You do a longitudinal petal empirical analysis and you look how notions shift over time or how, how much they're used actually. And if you do that, then you, I mean, there are many problems with this of course, but roughly you can say that it first of all incre increased. So if you look at brotherhood, for example, in English, it really goes down. So Solidarity increased. I think the data now is until 2019. So COVID is not in there yet. But if it would be in there, then I'm sure it would be even, you know, solidarity would be used even more than it, than it is already in the data. Um, and a text by Wolfgang Schmale analyzes these, these notion, basically says that solidarity in this specific European context um, emerged in the 19th century. He argues actually 1915, so in the Holy Alliance. Um, but it follows moments of crisis and wars, and that if you want kind of holds true for the European project, I mean, at least that's the, again, standard narrative for European integration. It was very much an idea to foster peace um, between the member states, um, which followed a war. So that's the, that's the kind of um, idea be behind it. But you could also argue that European solidarity as such simply formed in a specific, um, let's say, social thought and political thought context, which is geographically very European. And I will look at two, two of these. And you might also argue that it became specific um, during European integration and the legal framework that that produced, and that's the second part I will look at. So just briefly about the origin of it, and again, we discussed this just now, but it's interesting. So the word as such actually comes from, um, because we'll talk a lot about solidarity, so I think it's quite nice in the beginning to have like at least one quick uh, etymological background. So it was really a um, collective responsibility of a group. So that might have been a you know, collective meaning a family or, um, or a group that simply had a, a collective liability for the debt that a single member incurred um, as a whole, so to a third party. So it's really, um, it's really the idea that you're like bound as one solid body, responsibility, like responsible as a whole. And also interesting because the, so it comes from, from, from um, uh, debitum, which is this, in Latin, it's a past participle of devere, which, I mean, for those like Enrique who know uh, Latin, um, it's always in the past, it's a past participle, so you owe something and you will sort of be bound in the future. Um, that remained the same in French law in the Code Napoleon, for example. Um, if you look at Diderot's uh, Encyclopédie, it's also still the case. Um, so that kind of remained the main um, meaning of it. And then we have that shift in the 18th and 19th century um, in, in the Third Republic, where quite um, explicitly, um, and particularly by Leon Bourgeois, it was really a replacement uh, for Fraternité. So really explicitly saying, well, we're going to replace the notion of Fraternité with solidarity. Um, and the question that these early theorists asked is very much 
in line with some of the questions the European Union um, has as its discourse today. So it's very much about how do we understand social cohesion and how do we bound societies together, even though it's of course not in, on an international scale, but rather on a society scale. So there are two um, accounts that I want to look at in particular in that sort of period, because I think they, they are the most relevant ones. They're, I mean, they are non-exhaustive. You could also look at the Christian tradition, you could look at the socialist tradition, there's a the nationalist tradition. This is the sort of scientific, if you want, in case of sociology of Durkheim, the scientific tradition and politics, if you want, um, where the main proponent is um, Leon Bourgeois. So I will look briefly at these to better understand what kind of um, conception there was in the beginning when that shift happened. Um, and let's start with Durkheim. I'm sure you're all aware. That's kind of the, this is the main, like if you in, in social science say solidarity, most people would probably think of Durkheim because he has this famous, this famous distinction between um, mechanical and organic solidarity. But the point here is simply that in his view, you, once you have the introduction of a division of labor, so in modern societies where you have the transition to commercial societies, you have industrialization and so forth, there will be a different kind of social bond which does not rely on uh, identity and homogeneity as it was before in his view, but actually relies on or is built on uh, difference and heterogeneity. That's the first um, kind of, let's say, standard distinction that he makes um, between uh, mechanical, so again, based on identity and organic solidarity, which will become useful later. And what's often forgotten, at least for, like if you're not a Durkheimian Dukheim, scholar, is that um, he then kind of asked, like, so in a methodological sense, so how do you study this? And he actually used the law as an index. So the, there is a, an index thesis. I mean, it's later on, Stephen Dukes, I think, used the term first, I'm not entirely sure. Um, he called it an index thesis. So basically that the law can uh, be used as an empirical measure for uh, solidarity. That's, of course, debatable whether that actually works. And Durkheim himself distanced himself from, from this notion as well later on. But it's an interesting heuristic device to think about um, law as a kind of operator of solidarity, but also as, um, as a measure for it. So if it's not produced, solidarity, then in Durkheim's view, basically you would be in a state of anomie, so nomos in Greek is obviously the law, so if you don't have that, then you're in that um, anomic state. So that is a reason why you might look at the law if you talk about solidarity from that sort of first sociological conception proper. Um, I should also say that the, uh, the two notions that he uses are interestingly, like, I mean, they're very counterintuitive. So if you normally would probably think of um, organic solidarity as the first one, the sort of older one, because it sounds organic, it sounds, you know, kind of like a community-based version, but he explicitly did it the other way around because he was critical of the sort of mainly also German tradition, like, for example, Tönnies that used Gemeinschaft as a very like community-based notion, and he turned it around to be actually um, critical of that and use mechanical for the earlier one and organic for the later one. So we today in a, in a um, sort of modern society would be obviously in the latter, but he insisted that both will exist in the end. They will coexist if you want. Um, so the next one, that's the, that's the sort of political version of it, largely I would say forgotten, especially in the Anglo-American world, not so much in France, but in the, in the Anglo-American world, is um, Léon Bourgeois, who is the President du Conseil, so the kind of Prime Minister of the Third Republic, um, and very much was the, the person that really popularized that idea. So it really became, um, the, in his view, the kind of central um, narrative that you would need in a republic to have um, social justice, what we would call social justice today. So that is very much, in, in many ways, that prefigures the, the modern welfare state. And he explicitly used the, the notion of fraternité and translated it into um, a concept of solidarity. Um, just really briefly, because he's really not well known um, uh, anymore. So he was not only president, you can say, he was also the first president of League of Nations, so like the, what later on becomes the United Nations, and um, got the Nobel Peace Prize in, I think, 1920. So it really like sort of had a political impact simply because of his um, positions. And the content of that argument is that you basically, so you have a sort of social ontology, which means you're not 
like you're born into a society, you will always be related by social relations to each other and you will have a sort of normative trigger that is what he calls social debt. So you will be in a relation of debt, a bit like in the Roman law, <laughs> uh, to, uh, to each other. And that might then um, require legal cooperation. It might require regulation as well. And um, if, you, if you look at that in that sense, then um, it is not a natural effect of the social legal order, but rather has to be regulated. So basically, you have something like interdependence. I will go through this really quickly, um, which is produced by the division of labor, for example. And then that, is, that can be viewed as a debt relationship. So it's like a creditor and a debtor. Um, and then that is tantamount to a legal relationship, so it can be translated into welfare and health policy. That's the kind of overall argument. So overall, so what we learn from this, um, so first of all, I would say it's important to bear in mind that it's really a modern um, a response to the modern condition. So it's really, you know, you have, a, you, you have modernity as a threat to traditional bonds, to bonds of religion, to family, communities, and so on. It's often seen as a, maybe not destruction, but at least a lowering of uh, these kind of ties of effectual behavior of solidarity and so on. So then the question is how do you, how do you sort of create these bonds and the answer of more solidarity? Is it really a response to that expansion of, if you want, industrial or commercial society um, and also in the socialist sense at least um, to increase class um, juxtapositions? It's really a modern um, concern. And it sh again, it shifted, so that's the second kind of point. Um, it might be constructed and regulated by a law, so there's really this sort of legalist tradition, which is very typical of France in the 19th century, but like you have this kind of idea that the law might be uh, the way to go about it. And of course, during crisis, it's always, you know, it opens the space for critique, but also for conceptual change. So it's always a s sort of opportunity. And then we might ask, well, today, how is it then regulated or constructed in the EU? And if you use the index thesis as a sort of heuristic device, to be quite sociological about the law, you might take that and look at, well, if the law shifted in its notions and its interpretations from solidarity, then you know, the philosophical underpinnings might also have shifted. So you can kind of make an argument about the underlying sort of structure of that. Um, and this is a distinction I take from Andrea San Giovanni in a 2015 paper called um, Solidarity as Joint Action by now a kind of standard distinction, um, except for the fourth point, which I'm going to add later. So basically, you can, in that European context, um, sort of distinguish between national solidarity, which is the obvious one, it's internal to the nation state, that's still the identity, often identity-based notion that underpins the welfare state, for example, it's very classical conflict um, between that and the, the, the European notion of it, which the second one, member state solidarity, which is between nation states, so that's an international relations notion if you want. And the third one is um, transnational, so that's really between um, European citizens per se. So if you want, that's the kind of uh, extension of the social version I mentioned earlier. Um, and then, so this is not from San Giovanni's paper, but I would, I would add an external dimension, um, which I think is important in terms of solidarity because you might have um, Europe as an actor as a whole, for example, in foreign relations, and that might um, play a role on different levels, which we can't go into detail here, but if you think about um, the legal regulations um, regarding disaster management towards third states, then that plays a role because Europe might act as a whole, um, and the same holds, for example, for climate solidarity. But it might also refer to um, Europe as a whole as an identity construct, so you vis-a-vis -vis, uh, third states, let's say, um, in migration policy that actually plays a role and it might have, in terms of, at least in my view, in terms of Europe's history, a colonial past, if you look at the history of European integration, that actually sometimes at least might be seen as putting forward an idea of Europe as a whole vis-a-vis um, -vis other states. So there you have a dimension which I think is important because often ignored in European discussions on solidarity where you only focus on the internal dimension of it and not uh, on the external one. By the way, in philosophy, this might also refer to non-human actors, which is also very interesting. <laughs> We're not going to discuss this today. Um, so, and then if you do this distinction, again, very hu heuristically, 
And they might be reflected in different degrees, right? So if you just use that as a sort of outsider's perspective onto the law, um, then we can, we can start sort of with uh, Schumann's famous declaration of 1950, and I'm sure you all know this, but it's, I would, in this context, interesting to remember. So it's really an economic notion of solidarity. So he, the idea was to create de facto solidarity in Europe via the pooling of the coal and steel production. So that led to the European coal and steel community. And the idea was, of course, to prevent a war um, between France and Germany. And actually, the way he put it is to make it uh, materially impossible. So that is really a notion in our categories between member states. It's economically driven um, and is the sort of very early and very famous version of it. Really important um, as a principle it gets in the Treaty of Lisbon, so that's 2009, where it was really, or at least that's the legal scholarship consensus, where it was really strengthened as a, as a principle. Um, by the way, there's a huge discussion on whether or not it's a, uh, or how it's used as a principle, a value, sometimes it's a clause, you know, there are different versions of, is and, uh, of it, and I'm, as I said, not going into any legal um, interpretation. In Article 2, TU, which is the main sort of reference, it's actually listed after the values mostly discussed as a value, though, just to kind of uh, mention this. Um, and the, with the Treaty of Lisbon, the um, Charter of Fundamental Rights became primary law. There's a whole chapter on solidarity, so that's, uh, I think we'll hear more about this also the, the, in the coming days. It's also very interesting the way it's used there. But I'll get to my overall point. The, the, the way it's used is mainly uh, solidarity between member states. So. The main policy areas are really migration and asylum, of course, where you have Article 80 very famously. Um, then you have finance and monetary policy, which is very important in the crisis management um, uh, after the finance crisis, and in disaster management, such as the solidarity clause, for example. But these are all member state notions of it. Um, and in case law, perhaps more complicated, but overall, I think, similar. So the, the court has actually, like the, the Court of European Justice has uh, generally, I would say, sort of accepted the, the principle as a central part of the community. Uh, the famous reference point here is um, the, the argument that the principle is at the basis of the obligations as a whole, uh, of, the, of the community as a whole. Um, it can be argued that there, that there uh, I mean, there's a huge literature on this now, like, you know, how it was used in the law and how it is inter interpreted. There can be an argument that there was be a retreat from solidarity um, because sometimes the court has not used um, the principle, even though it could have, um, but that's a longer discussion. But overall, um, I would argue that the, the, it mainly refers to member state solidarity. So, and that um, leads us to um, a possible critique of this shift. So, if you again, that's a very sort of broad view. But if you if you um, look at the early work that we just looked at before, so the social origins, also the, the legal origins, have a clear social basis. So it's about social relations, and uh, this shift then is very much about international relations. So um, before it was constituted by individuals, if you want, not states, and then now it's very much about uh, international relations that constitute solidarity between each other. And I will give you a, uh, one case where that's really clear, even though it's from a different legal realm. That's um, a paper by um, Angela Siebold, who has argued this. If you trace the Schengen process, you can actually show how in the beginning it was used as solidarity among people. So you have a clear social relation. And then that's also still the case in the, in the um, preamble, by the way, so in, in 85. And then later on, it shifts to um, only, so it doesn't actually play a role anymore, which is like between member states. So you have that kind of move from people to, um, to states. So, and I will sort of, as an outlook, say that this might lead to um, sort of conflict and commitments. So member states, of course, will, will operate on um, electoral incentives. So you will have to follow your uh, welfare state arrangements and your um, preferences of your electorate, and often that will lead to a financial formulation of solidarity. So that really has national economic underpinnings, right? You will follow your, uh, like the nation state will follow its own incentives, which might, of course, clash with notions of European-wide solidarity. So 
That happened, for example, after the crisis, uh, the debt crisis in particular, and the migration crisis, where you had a strong national backlash, nationalist backlash, that then, of course, might undermine wider notions of um, solidarity, like in the European sense. Um, an argument in political science that draws on this kind of perspective would be that the EU had, a, of course, huge expansion in financial instruments after the crisis, um, and that these competencies were not really matched by a social agenda. That's a, you know, a long-standing argument, but it's interesting in this context because it reflects the different uh, levels of solidarity. So again, it would be member state solidarity versus the transnational one, which might be social in origin. Um, and I will, as an outlook, um, sort of conclude with a, another classic question, which refers to what I've been just saying. So, you know, it was often argued that the EU can really be created via union law. So the law as the sort of um, producer of European solidarity, also in European integration, um, that is an argument that in the end, similar to the economic de facto solidarity, once you have the law that might trigger uh, relations of solidarity. So, but this actually rather, what we've, what we've talked about now, actually rather points to the limits of, um, of that point because you would need a transnational level of solidarity in order to underpin um, the member state one. At least that might be a hypothesis that, that uh, would criticize the idea that you can simply um, bring about solidarity via the law. So if that transnational version is in short supply, then um, it might not be sufficient to simply include citizens in a legal sense, but actually you would need um, an expansion of, for example, social Europe. Um, and to conclude, that is kind of the same point, so they might conflict but um, so if you have a strengthen of um, nationalist identities that could, of course, undermine um, European solidarity as a, as a wider transnational version, but um, it might be then helpful to actually look back at what we've seen regarding Durkheim. So as you remember, the, the modern one was actually based on difference in not identity. And in that sense, then, uh, so if the central narrative of European solidarity and also integration in a, in a wider sense um, is based on identity, it might really be in conflict um, with the sociological roots that we just looked at. So thank you so much, um, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rowan, for this splendid presentation that uh, was um, in line with what you anticipated. It was a very dense and elaborate text with multiple uh, facets and sides that has different approaches uh, from different disciplines. I have the feeling that you also um, honored the character that I mentioned in my presentation, Erasmo of Rotterdam, because you mentioned a recommendation that Erasmo did at the beginning of the 16th century. And I think it's a recommendation by Erasmo of Rotterdam that is very current in the field of social sciences. As he said, however, things cannot be apprehended, but for the science of the voices of the world, those who don't know the efficiency of language are blind when it comes to judging things and are obliged to suffer hallucinations and delirium. What Erasmus says here is something that is very well known, um, at least in classical times. Words are our way to know the world and the limits of understanding the complexity of the world are the limits of our own worlds, as Wittgenstein would put it in more current times. So we have to understand from the beginning with that rule of conduct that is already in the Bible 
because Saint John himself said at the beginning of the um, at, at the beginning of his text was word was at the beginning. So let us conceive it as words as the articulate human sound. Words are that minimum unit of communication and that are articulated in phonetic symbols or sounds and that transmit an idea or a thought. And this takes us to what I meant, studying the origin, the evolution, the transformation of the semantic field of the term, and, and let's say it's a word, the word solidarity, understanding the semantics of the word solidarity, it's fundamental to know what we are talking about and to know whether we are on the same page and talking about the same thing. It's like uh, Lenin and Mussolini agreeing on uh, the term freedom. Uh, you, can, you may think that you are agreeing when you are actually disagreeing because you're not talking about the same thing. So we need to understand the etymology of the word in all the languages that have used that word solidarity. And that's a very uh, revealing way of understanding um, the term and it's problematic as a concept. Not as a term, but as a concept, as a distinct, clear concept. Because for example, a square circle is a word or, or melted snow, that can be a word, but it's not a concept. What do I mean? I mean that I think it's uh, totally accurate and correct to refer to the Latin uh, origin of the word. But I would go even farther. Solidarity has an Indo-European root. Uh, Indo-European is a language that you, we know through um, archaeology, but nobody has ever found a speaker or a text of Indo-European. We just have remains, remnants through other languages. So when we talk that we say that the language of the Iranians, Persians, and Latin come from that common language in the European. In, in the European, the root solitus leads back to what we understand in Spanish as whole, compact, solid. In, in other Roman languages and in English, it comes from the same thing, because that's what Latin meant. It meant the same thing, something that's compact, but compact in the meaning that is composed of parts, parts that come together and create a solitum, a solitum that uh, in, in Latin, before becoming a language, uh, a, com a legal language, it means like a wall composed of many parts. That was, that's what solitum means. The im solidarium um, is connected to the belonging to something that is solid. And the last particle that talks about the quality, the quality of, be of being solitum. Where do I want to get to? I mean that this word since the beginning uh, refers to diverse parts that come together to create something that is larger, that is solid, solid in the face of something, as you were saying in your text. C can we have conflicting solidarities? Yes, indeed, because solidarity is based on things in the face of other things. So solidarity is not only conflictive, the concept itself, European solidarity, uh, involves against something. Solidarity against who? Against the Chinese? Against a foreign invasion? Against others? And just as when we say that there are three people here, we have the notion of number. It's a very complex idea. And in your text, you were mentioning, uh, and in connection with these etymological um, aspects, you were saying that it's a modern form of the word fraternity, fraternity, fraternité. Um, it is indeed because the change of words usually refers to a much broader change in the semantic field. And uh, solidarity is born in France throughout the 18th and 19th century mostly as an alternative to fraternité, to fraternity, as a, a secular republican alternative to avoid the word fraternity that was imbued by two things, by the uh, Jacobin use and the religious use, because uh, fraternity 
has strong uh, religious connotation. It also comes from Latin. It comes from frater, brother. And fraternity is a condition of being brothers. Who's fraternal? Well, my brother. So uh, brothers are organic solidarity. Fraternity is organic solidarity. It's not parts. But I mean, fraternity is the biblical mandate to treat others the way you would like to be treated. And in illustration, it's connected to the Kantian imperative. In the, your, the motto must be the principle of universal legislation. Law is the same for me as it is for others. The principle of fraternity is different because in principle, it's a um, horis, uh, regulatory horizontal and is horizontal. Um, we are fraternal, humans are fraternal because we walk on two legs and we can produce language, whatever that language is, English or Indo-European or whatever. But solidarity is not strictly equivalent. Solidarity is the difference between human rights and citizen rights. In the, as um, citizen rights, when we talk about citizen rights, we have the right to be protected by law. But those who come here don't always have the same rights. There's no necess there's so uh, human rights are not necessarily in conflict with human rights. We are seeing that with minority that are illegal and that are migrant. They don't have those same citizen rights. Why did we change solidarity? Why did we use solidarity instead of fraternity? It comes from the secularization process, especially in France, and that uh, secularization that happened in other countries and the removal of that um, religious domination, whether it was Catholic or Protestant, from the cultural life. But in that shift, man, we lost many things. Um, fraternity is horizontal, whereas uh, solidarity is not universal. I just wanted to um, give these brief ideas about that. Ha. Hi, Ruben. Thanks very much for your insightful presentation. It was really interesting seeing this, this uh, issue of the topic of the <coughs> European solidarity through the lens of sociology. That is one of the different approach that we can have on, uh, on this issue. And I, I found interesting your contraposition between uh, <coughs> uh, the solidarity of the folks, of the people, and the solidarity of the states. Because uh, <coughs> we are assisting, we are testifying uh, in some way, uh, the governments, the states, are blowing on the, the nationalist discourse. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that they, has, they are using the words, uh, <laughs> coming back to the Rotterdam, uh, Erasmus, uh, the Rotterdam uh, uh, talk. Uh, we, are, we are assisting on, uh, uh, on a, an att attempt, maybe successful, to undermine the cohesion and the solidarity of the European Union within the same European Union, because there are states, Visegrad, uh, you know, the Visegrad group, uh, and we have also Russia that is using the nationalist discourse to, uh, to this kind of narrative uh, that works uh, over on, uh, on the pride, uh, on the, belong of the um, heritage, the national belongings, and so on, that is uh, blowing uh, and, uh, and, and uh, with the purpose of undermining the European institution, the solidarity. But what 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 is a uh, is a uh, bizarre uh, that you, you I mean you pre you presented uh, uh, two kinds of solidarity, solidarity of the people and solidarity of the states. Now my question is, what do you think about uh, this uh, uh, this nationalist discourse uh, that is blowing uh, is pushed so so hard uh, by governments that are members of the European Union that overlaps with the solidarity of the people. Because, I mean, they, they rely on a nationalist discourse, but it's made by governments. So, I mean, I do you think that uh, it, it clashes, this, this, uh, uh, the state solidarity clashes um, against uh, um, uh, the solidarity of the peoples, overlap, or, I mean, I'd like to have your opinion on this, uh, on this issue. Thanks. I respond to Enrique uh, first. I mean, I, I think it's very interesting what you were saying. Like, I mean, the, um, 
I, so in some ways, like the, I mean, I like that you stress the opposition part. Um, there is a discussion whether or not that is a sort of conceptual requirement. You can say that in actions it might be needed because you need some uh, obstacle that you might overcome as a group. Um, some also argue that it's actually not a uh, normative or ethically value, valuable ideal because it's oppositional or some say partitive in, in nature. So that, that is, I, I quite like that you stress that similar, similarly, that's you know, in a similar manner as I stress the sort of problematic uh, European dimension that it might have. Um, and I also like the, the, you know, the sort of stressing of the Republican alternative towards the, um, towards fraternity. There's, there's of course a question of whether or not it was a, a synonym, like Habermas, for example, said that Heinrich Heine still used the two in the same, um, in the same way, so synonymously, and it was a functional equivalent. Some argued that way. Uh, from, a, from a sort of intellectual history perspective, I of course fully agree. So the, you have a sort of different realm that, that comes in. Um, the Kantian universalism, by the way, in Durkheim, you also find that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's very similar in many ways. Um, and yeah, Marco, I don't, I don't know if I have a sort of opinion on this. I mean, that's a very political question. I mean, you, you know, in, in a way, the, what I wanted to do is simply sort of point to the um, conflicting dimensions the term might have, because it's very much used, norm normally very much used in a very positive sense, especially when it's linked to the European version. Um, and it might just simply embody conflicts, in particular on the social kind of scale. Um, but I don't, you know, sort of have a strong opinion on uh, uh, the nationalist claims of some governments. I mean, that's, you know, that, that's just, a, in the end, you, you, I mean, you might say that that's just the, balance of power that, uh, that any union of states might have to somehow regulate via law, for example. I mean, you know, you will, <laughs> you will always kind of have that clash as long as, as, as there are national electorates and incentives to perform well as a national economy. I do not agree at all with you because it's not only political discourse. I mean, it's a sociological one also because when you have a government that blows over the nationalist discourse against votes, I mean, it means that uh, it, it's able to talk to the majority of the population because these governments, uh, uh, the Visegrad countries, these, these governments that, that blow over the nationalist discourse, uh, in this way undermining the European solidarity in the European Union, they, I mean, they, they trigger the, the population with them. I mean, they, they are able to, to get, uh, uh, they, they got a, a, a big uh, uh, success with this, this kind of discourse, you, you see. So it, it's not politics because it, it, it relates to the people. So when, when you spoke about uh, the solidarity of the people versus the solidarity of the states, uh, I mean, in this case, I do, not see, I do not see any kind of difference because the solidarity of the people is undermined by the government and the, 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 these governments undermine the European solidarity through, through the votes, I mean, through the uh, recognition by the, 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 the voters, the, you know, so, uh, I mean, it's not a political discourse, it's something that overlaps, it's much, much more complicated, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, it's, <laughs> indeed, it's very complicated, but I, I mean, I would, I would also not say something like that the governments undermine uh, solidarity, you know, it's all democracies that, uh, you know, follow, follow their sort of voting behaviors in the end, like, um, and you could also, for example, as a, on a welfare level, you could argue that you very much need the national identities. That's still what most people sort of support in terms of um, solidarity, so at least if you look at public opinion, it's mainly uh, the direct support for the national realm, not for the European one. So you might also, in that sense, argue that it's very necessary to have these identities. The tradition of liberal nationalism, for example, in political philosophy very much argues that. Um, so it's a very complex issue, I would say. Yeah, I mean, that's like at the heart of the whole, <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, it's, it's difficult, yeah. Yes, uh, thank, uh, thank you. Uh, I wanted to, to put the point of two, two aspects of your paper. The first point is you, you you present a sort of jump between Léon Bourgeois and Schumann. Uh, in the secularism of the late 19th century and beginning 20th century, there is an, uh, an internal aspect, national aspect, and international aspects. And the link is already made. And as you mentioned the First World War, the crisis, uh, as a major uh, opportunity to uh, operate some jump, it's 
clearly the First World War that uh, facilitate the transfer from uh, internal conception to international or more uh, specifically European conception due with the League of Nations. And in the League of Nations, you have uh, the ideology of bourgeois, solidarism, and also uh, others. But you are, you are really a, a, a transfer between the two. So I think it's very important because the League of Nations is also the International uh, Work Bureau, etc. Et so you have all the aspects. The second point is, uh, uh, you know, uh, everybody's uh, quote uh, Schumann declaration, but you, you, have, you, you have to know how he was r uh, written and by who. Jean Monnet has not uh, uh, theoretical uh, knowledge. For him, it, it is more uh, a functional, functional concept than every. But you are right, and uh, we all agree with uh, the, the first uh, uh, step of the European integration, uh, the integration, the market integration of iron and steel with counterparties in social policies and uh, cooperation on economic field, also in research and technology, etc. So we have two aspects. The third uh, aspect is probably uh, the link between European and international. Because you speak between the, of the relations uh, between European level and national level. But we have also the uh, solidarity between Europeans to be able to exist and take position on the international levels. It's not only a political way uh, to present the problem, because if you look at common policies from the 80s, each of them has an international and a national aspect. And the two are linked. So uh, this, uh, cons uh, this pr uh, way to analyze uh, uh, sorry, Director, I think it's, it's very important. Um, just, yeah, I mean, th yeah, thank you so much. It's, it's very interesting. Also, I really, I mean, obviously, you always have to leave out, uh, you know, sort of more detail, but I, I fully agree. The, I actually think that the international aspect of that whole period is very interesting. Um, in Durkham, you even have a sort of discussion of a European wide society, which then, which actually, like, if you think about the division of labor, which used the national context, he actually mentions the international division of labor, which then very much happens in Europe, which would create a solidarity. And that's at least the, the kind of, you know, contextual idea of it. So, um, and of course, in, in bourgeois, I mean, yeah, it's, the League of Nations is, of course, an international sort of body that, uh, where, that where that is created. So I really, uh, I really agree, and thank you for the, for the comments. Um, and I also agree with the, with the Schumann Declaration, the the um, yeah the international link um, that that you mentioned. It's yeah I can only agree. I mean it's uh, I think the um, yeah I don't really have. I mean there was no real you know sort of criticism. I I, I fully agree with everything. So yeah. Ruben. Muchas felicidades. Congratulations. Congratulations for your work, for your presentation. And following the interventions by Enrique Moradiellos and the words of Eric Rochev, I want to say that you have a great opportunity. Well, I want to congratulate you because I really enjoy delving into the concepts and how words have duplicities, how words evolve, and, and how the European process, integration process, can renew itself and can uh, reinvent itself once and again. So, <clears throat> I also want to say that you have a great opportunity, a major opportunity in these decisive times that we are living, to deploy even farther the concepts, the words, the actions, the determinations, what power means, the power of the word solidarity. 
And I say this because solidarity has always been understood as a value, mostly, in our European Charter of Fundamental Rights, the values of freedom, dignity, equality, and solidarity in the framework of citizenship and, and justice are our values. They're connected legally in our Lisbon Treaty. They are values. We understand solidarity as a value, as a, as a concept connected to action. Right now in the border of Belarus, we see um, this terrible and sad humanitarian crisis and, and, but, and Putin. I was writing a couple of days ago about Putin as a, as a feudal lord manipulating this geostrategical situation. So honestly, I think that solidarity in our days is gaining a new perspective, a new power in addition to um, what it was already. With the European Recovery Funds, next generation EU funds, with those funds, solidarity is made even more clear. And from the political action of the European Council, the summit, and we are seeing how the um, solidarity of each, the responsibility of each government and how it's connected to the Green Deal, this, that's been even more um, clear. Solidarity, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it this way. The concept of solidarity and, the, and its action are becoming ever more relevant and are becoming ever more politically powerful because put together and connected to the uh, European Recovery Fund and connected to how those states uh, receive or do not receive those funds based on those sustainability vectors and digital digitalization vectors, those two pillars, digitalization and sustainability, and how these uh, European funds and this common debt issued in, in and agreed for the first time in a common way by the uh, chief of states of the European states. All of this has taken solidarity to uh, to the next level. And they have taken this to, um, to the daily lives, to companies that want to survive, and those companies who want to um, locate their strengths based on those two pillars. So it has taken solidarity to another level. I want to congratulate you, Ruben, because I think that you have the great opportunity in your hands to do something. You have talked about the concept of, of that shift from legal to social and economical realm. I think everything complements each other and everything can be integrated. That's what the European integration is about. That's a, a social and political uh, process. I think you have the duty, if, if you allow me to say this, you uh, wrote such an important uh, paper and words really matter. And people here in Houston know I am someone who is really careful with words. I always uh, choose and pick my words very carefully because they vertebrate everything. I think you have the capacity to take the reforming capacity of the concept and the action of solidarity, and you can translate that concept into your work, your thesis, and your publications, because it's tangible. And I think this word is ever more powerful than ever because of its political impact. That's my vision. Congratulations once again. Just maybe two quick points because the humanitarian level you mentioned um, that is that is that is in sort of like obvious application of the more you know social or personal side of it. So UNHCR, for example, very clearly advocates that side, which is not a, necessarily a member state um, level. So that very much has that dimension, and the same 
in a different way holds for the, um, I mean, hopefully for the Green Day, a Green Deal and recovery funds if they actually manage to implement a sort of more social sense of solidarity. But um, it's interesting because what you were saying, like the, I think maybe that's a chance, but also a danger that it's rhetorically so powerful because it can also easily be used as a mere rhetoric without actually any legal underpinning or any political uh, will, let's say. Um, and that's in itself interesting empirically because I mean, why is it solidarity that's suddenly resonating so much, right? It could be corporation or charity or fraternité, you know, like, but it seems like that's really the term that works also in a climate context. Um, so yeah, that's it. You, I completely agree. <laughs> So first of all, I want to congratulate you for your presentation. I think it was quite interesting to have you as the first speaker because, yes, the starting point is the concept, the notion of solidarity. We're going to talk about the principle of solidarity in the European Union. So it is only relevant to speak about the notion, the meaning of solidarity in the first speech because that will start the rest of the, of the debate. So I think it was very good to have you as the first speaker. When I was listening to you speak about the origin of the word and its evolution, I got the message that the notion of solidarity has evolved as the European Union has evolved. You were saying that notion, um, solidarity was an economic notion at the beginning, which is the origin of the European Union. Too. So my question is, this notion of solidarity when the European Union started, became, did, it became, did it become a purpose, a goal, so that it was the, the main goal and then the European, the European Union tried to achieve it? Or was it the opposite, the notion of solidarity became full of content as the European Union evolved. So we, it incarnated the goals of the European Union. So I repeat my question. What was first? The notion of solidarity, which became the goal of the European Union, or the contrary? The solidarity, the notion of solidarity became enriched um, um, fill it, filled itself with the notions that emanated from the European Union. And secondly, you were talking about transnational solidarity. So do you think that the current notion of solidarity enshrined in the European Union, could it become, could it evolve towards a more transnational solidarity? Because maybe it has reached its limit in terms of member state solidarity, so we could evolve towards a transnational solidarity. What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> I should I should just try to do it in Spanish because like, then I don't always have to wait. I mean, I probably will get everything. It's just Spanish is just so rusty. Uh, I would, so the first thing, I mean, there's a sort of I think, and I wasn't clear on this. Um, if you in history do a genealogy, I think there's always sort of a danger to, to go back to sort of grand narratives, which I didn't want to do. So there was not the idea to sort of tell a linear story of a concept that doesn't, that doesn't work historically and is also not the case. These are really, uh, you know, they always need to be placed in specific contexts, like for example, Roman civil law, which is very different, of course, from, from the 19th century. But you can, in at least philosophical sense, look at them and ask, well, is there something like a conceptual, you know, inherent sort of similarity in what they mean, right? That's at least one way to do it. So I didn't want to say that it's sort of involved as like one single concept concept throughout time. Um, uh, there's a scholar on Solidarity Hayward once said that it only in retrospective looks as a single narrative, right? Like, um, so that I didn't I didn't want to say that just to just to be clear on that whether or not it evolved. Um, I mean, sort of the the chicken egg question, <laughs> which one was first? Uh, I don't I, I don't know. I would say it's a specific context in the EU in which it of course became in a way powerful because it's. Um, politically powerful, it has it has legal value, so it's actually um, part of the governance structure, if you want. So, in that sense, yes, it, it has evolved and changed with it. Um, as an ideal, I would say it was there before. Um, I mean, so not uh, also before the union, of course. 
But um, so as, as, as we discussed, like you have it already uh, end of 19th century and early 20th century, and particularly after the First World War, I would say you have it at least in some sense. Um, so uh, at least you could argue that. I mean, so I, I would think it's, it's earlier, but I don't want to make that claim. I don't know if you can, if that would make historical sense at all. Um, so yeah, so I would say it's important to read it sort of as a specific notion that's specific to some policy fields and specific to legal context in which it is in, and then you can you know analyze it. Thank you. Congratulations for your work, which is quite broad and covers all aspects that we can consider the principle of solidarity from. But I want to make a brief comment from my perspective. I have a legal perspective, of course, I'm a jurist, which I know is not yet the same point of view you have described. But I want to shed some light. So in my view, the legal framework, the law is not composed just of laws, but it's also composed of legal institutions, um, including um, bodies and principles and tenets, etc. In the sense of the definition given by Santi Romano and other current institution, it's Heather Rieck or McCormick, for example. The principle of solidarity is a legal institution in itself. It is not just a philosophical concept underlying it. It projects some effects within the legal framework. But how can we understand these legal institutions? Santi Romano said, that the institutions, the legal institutions are the force of the social acts translated into legal, into a legal form. So something that takes place in the society that is then enshrined into the legal framework. And it is described in a legal way. So the principle of solidarity is a legal institution very clearly it is so in the European Union and has its own potential. Potential. So it could be useful from this institutionalist perspective. And you could study how the um, Court of Justice of the European Union has studied this, because the legal institutions, when they enter the legal framework, they, they do not become fixed uh, in, in stone. They evolve, of course, as the institution evolves. And the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union describes it in, a, in its case law. So this is just as a complement to what we have already explained in your, in your paper. That's it. Thank you. No, thank you again. I mean, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a lot to, I mean, I'm, I'm not trained as a lawyer, obviously, and the, the sort of sociological um, philosophical perspective is a very different one. From a sociology of law in a more traditional sense, you could also really look at institutions and how actually, for example, judges in a, you know, in a social context actually um, work. But the idea here was, of course, conceptual, so it's a different kind of approach um, in the first place. Um, and I specifically did not want to get into the uh, interpretation of case law and the and the sort of tracing of the the court of justice because first again I'm not trained in it but also there's a huge literature uh, doing this um, in the commentary on the on the case law on solidarity there's there's so much written um, where you can of course uh, trace the evolving notion of it and I just wanted to kind of rather look at what what the main sort of um, conceptual underpinning might be so but yeah thank you so much of course like in, in the legal perspective there would be so much more to to do yeah. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ruben. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk, and I'm, I'm really excited about um, well the discussion that will, I, I think, evolve after I also present, because I think we have some, um, yeah, some intertwining points of view, but also um, 
I think, quite different approaches. Um, and what I wanted to ask you about is um, this um, slide that you had with the four levels that you also base on San Giovanni's work. And I just wanted um, to, to ask you, so if we think about solidarity as something that somehow comes from a, um, let's say, societal uh, realm where we have um, individuals living together and the way that they are bonded uh, through, through different types of bonds of solidarity, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the bridge from here to the institutions. And, um, and here I mean both member states, but also European institutions and, and beyond. So um, yeah, how, how can institutions be agents if we are talking about something that is um, a fundamentally uh, societal uh, concept? Thank you. I, know, I, know what you're, I think I know what you're pointing at. No, I didn't actually want to say that it is I mean, that is one dimension of it, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be the only one. Because I guess what you're referring to is how to create, uh, in a solidaristic sense, public institutions that are based on that, for example, via a joint production of them, right? Um, so my point would re was rather that there are different traditions, you can view it in different ways, and it doesn't only have to be member state solidarity, uh, which does not exclude the, the sort of um, grounding of institutions um, in a notion of solidarity on a social level. So you might argue that that's kind of the, the implicitly, at least the point I made in the end, that you, in order for the sort of institutional level to work, and also on a electoral level, but maybe also just on a sort of social agreement level, that you might need that fundamental so social level first in order for um, the institutional one to actually function. So, and the bridge for it, I mean, I would, I would in this case just follow that sort of historical joint production of institution that then binds, um, you know, populations together. But, but again, that was just rather to single out narratives um, and not to say that solidarity necessarily um, has to be uh, on that kind of social level. It's just different dimensions. Yeah, but I'm also very much looking forward to the discussion. I mean, I think we'll talk more about the, this issue. Thank you very much for, for your presentation. And then, uh, I mean, my question uh, refers to the concept that you, you mentioned, which is the burden sharing. Of course, you, you also mentioned while uh, going through your presentation that actually, uh, or I understood it as uh, it is normally used with an uh, economic connotation. Um, my question is, what should we do in order you know, to disentangle <laughs> the two things? Because to me, bargain sharing is much more than an economic concept. And maybe, I mean, it comes, to put it in, into context, because of the sovereign debt crisis you also mentioned. And, um, again, how we could disentangle this concept of bargain sharing uh, from the charity concept you to, I mean, to, to touch upon in one of your answers. Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it's not a normative paper, so I don't know what we should do, uh, which is another Kantian uh, question. Um, um, yeah, I mean, in, in a way, the we talked about the recovery fund briefly earlier, but there you have an example where it might be very, you know, very productive in terms of solidarity. I mean, you, financial solidarity is not like necessary. <laughs> you know, it's not something that I was trying to criticize. It can just relate on a very economic foundation of it, which might be problematic if it just opposes member states and then decreases um, European solidarity, if that happens, but it's a possibility. But I, I sort of, I don't have an answer for what should happen. One of the hypotheses I also pointed at, or it's at least an argument that's often made in um, political economy, quite traditionally, is that you, it should be underpinned if you have, what I was mentioning earlier, if you have uh, strong financial instruments, should be underpinned by um, a social equivalent. That, that would be one, but it's not an, so I'm not providing a normative underpinning for this, I'm just saying that is an answer that you might want to give from a social science perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben, for your talk. It was magnificent and it really puts that, it really sets the context for the topics that we're going to deal with. I'm going to be more pragmatic in my in my comment, 
Because it is true that I, I agree with uh, Vanessa's question about the evolution of solidarity through time, especially um, from a European perspective. Um, you've talked about the four dimensions, and I think they are critical. They are very important, the legal point of view, the social point of view, the political point of view, as Susana mentioned with the river. Uh, sorry, uh, Susana del Rio, as she mentioned, too. But I think it's important to understand the title of your presentation. Uh, in times of crisis, when you started this research and the proposal that you sent, that you submitted, of course, we, we, we could not imagine the great crisis we were going to live at the time, you were writing a paper about the crisis that gave birth to the European Union and to, well, of course, which was very different from the pandemic. But we are now on the verge of the abyss, and we now have to see whether we can build the bridge towards the other side of the abyss by applying the principle of solidarity. And I think it's the principle of solidarity has made it possible for us to cross that bridge, to build that bridge and to cross it. So I think you should include in your paper that new dimension of solidarity that has emerged after the COVID-19 pandemic, which is a completely exceptional situation. And within those four types of solidarity that you were talking about, it has it adds it adds to the fourth level that you mentioned the external solidarity it has a special connotation and i think that crisis really has shown that the four levels of solidarity the four types of solidarity exist especially the external one this crisis is quite exceptional and you really need to talk about it in your paper um, also because you, that way you would be including some uh, future perspective um, because the evolution of the principle of solidarity can evolve in a different way thanks to this pandemic. And as the Dr. Professor Fraser says, it, it, has a, um, it can be mirrored in the legal code, in the legal framework. And maybe you can also take into account my comments because as we were talking, as we were, as we were saying earlier, someone talked about the, about the origin, the beginning of the European Union or the, or the, the origin of Europe. So for your final version of your paper, you should include an analysis of how the Conference of the Future of Europe talks about the principle of solidarity. Because I am eager to see how you deal with it. Because my question is, the principle of solidarity is really included in the demands of the citizens, or are we focusing on two basic things, such as healthcare or um, the, the, the integrity of the European Union? But are we talking about principle of solidarity in that conference? Because that could add some added value that we can use in the future of the European Union. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Miguel. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to include that, even though I think like, you know, I'm somewhat skeptical about the COVID crisis point because it's very early to actually, in a, at least in a social scientific sense, to actually say something about it. But I also have the sense that it might really, you know, lead to different arrangements, as we already kind of discussed, especially um, when it comes to finance. But um, so yeah, I'm happy to to to, to look at that. The um, at least to you know sort of include it in the in the points. What you were mentioning, I mean, of course, you know, the the sort of future of Europe debate. That's that's something where, in a general sort of development, you might argue that the whole point about the the social sort of transnational sense of solidarity actually it already is changing because like you one might make the argument there are clear sort of efforts 
by the EU to actually go that direction more. I mean, you know, for example, that the, the conference would be one of these efforts. Whether or not that works is a different point, but it's there are maybe um, sort of efforts to include include that social dimension more. So I I think it's a very valid um, comment. Yeah. So thank you so much. Um, hola Rubén, te felicito por la charla. Eh, te quiero hacer una pregunta más de orden personal, más como, eh, como filósofo. Y tiene que ver más con el, el título, el, el principio de solidaridad. En ese sentido, principio puede ser principio en términos morales o principio como el inicio de algo. Eh, decías también que había una serie de conceptos relacionados, que podría ser cooperación, empatía, filantropía, caridad, eh, algo prosocial. ¿Cuál es la, la, la naturaleza de, de esa solidaridad? ¿Es un sentimiento? ¿Es un comportamiento? ¿Es una actitud? ¿Hace parte de un pacto social? Porque en esa medida podríamos decir que se, debe, se puede obligar por ley, ¿Y uh, cómo la podemos medir? O sea, si la solidaridad puede medirse en ese sentido. Gracias. Um, so, yeah, thanks. I mean, I don't actually have a uh, sort of a philosophical opinion on that. I'm more from the, so I would look at how things might conceptually change and look at what they once meant or what they mean now and rather sort of, you know, look at it from the outside instead of actually making a normative claim about it. If I would have to make that now, I would say it's not based on feeling, I would say it's based on some form of action and that can take very different forms. Um, but the, the sort of emotional side of it um, might be one aspect, but it often has that exclusionary tendency that we talked about earlier. So once you do that, then you often get a sort of emotionally identity sense uh, of solidarity which often leads to a very exclusive notion of it. There can be groups, there can be nations, but so I would, like, so if you ask me, I, I would not defend this, but I would say it's more based on an, uh, on an action and then rather than um, an experience, for example, or an emotion or an identity, which does not mean that these wouldn't exist and could also fall under the category of solidarity, of course. But yeah, so that would be my, my answer to that. Is it, is it, yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your excellent presentation and for very interesting insights. My question is about a concept that is related to solidarity and this is reciprocity. Uh, so how do you understand um, reciprocity in relation to solidarity? Because, for instance, we can take the example of Poland. Uh, some people argue that other member states showed solidarity towards Poland um, I would say economic solidarity towards Poland uh, in the past. Uh, and then Poland actually didn't show solidarity towards the European Union when it came to uh, during the refugee crisis. Uh, and it actually blocked uh, the refugee quotas, the allocation of refugees, uh, the proportion of allocation of refugees uh, in the European Union. Uh, so, how do you understand the res reciprocity that, for instance, in this case, wasn't really there. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question, which I do not have a good answer to. But um, so the Poland case, I don't, I don't know enough about it. Um, but I would, I would say uh, more generally that the, the sort of difference in this case would be something like the level of conditionality. So if you, you know, in this, like you can have solidarity with, without that level of conditionality, like you don't necessarily need to expect that sort of return. Reciprocity as a principle traditionally kind of works along these ways, right? You, you do have, and you, you do have it as well in the EU actually for solidarity, and it's debatable whether or not that actually is a good idea to have these, so for example, inflexible solidarity, you have it a lot um, in conditional solidarity in the EU, which is discussed very often it's a debate that I cannot answer whether or not that is actually um, a conceptually good idea to actually link these. Um, in charity, for example, you very clearly do not have it because you obviously, you know, sort of operate on the idea that you will something will do something without expecting a reciprocal return. Um, so, but I would say that's the that's the sort of difference I would I would suggest. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't understand uh, reciprocity as a necessary a part of solidarity. This, that's it. I like guess. as a yeah, I mean it. It would I think it would depend on the kind of solidarity. Like I would say yeah, to some extent maybe, but yeah, it I guess it really depends. Like in the uh, 
Yeah, it, it depends. In the sociological sense, for example, it normally would kind of be considered like this because it's very functional in a, in a structural sense. So you would always sort of return something anyway in that reciprocal sense. But yeah, in the, on an international scale, for example, in the Poland case, it might have very different sort of contextual you know, elements that I'm not aware of. So yeah, thank you so much for the Th question. Thank you. Thank you.